Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham and joining me is Matt. Hello. And this week we are looking at 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me. This is the first episode we've recorded since the episode on OHMSS came out. And I knew it would be divisive. (laughs) I didn't appreciate perhaps how divisive, because no one seems to have a middling opinion of that movie. Yes, I've noticed that in the comments, too, where like lots and lots of people are like, this movie rules. And then there's a few people who are like, this is the worst trash Bond movie that it was ever made. It's a zero out of ten, literally unwatchable. To be to be clear, your personal opinions, listener at home, are completely valid and okay. Ours aren't more real just because we're doing a podcast about it. Well, maybe yours aren't. It did amuse me. The gulf between like, thank you for giving this movie the props it rightfully deserves. And <laughs> I listened to you for all three hours and I don't understand what you're saying. And it was just sort of like, wow, that's it's interesting i think everyone was like fairly in agreement for the first batch but in the interest of further division we're looking at the spy who loved me and (laughs) i infer you can correct me if i'm wrong from a very oblique tweet that you made Mm -hmm. that you you really 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 like this one i do and from watching special features on the dvd the team behind it like the producers all the actors they talk of it in reverent tone as one of the best (laughs) ones they ever made and i don't see it oh wow it's fun don't get me wrong but I, i i hear them talking about it and i'm just sort of like are we talking about the same movie? Like, I don't I don't think it's even bad. It's just that they're like, oh, and then we came to the spy who loved me. And oh, boy, let me tell you. Oh, you know, they're, they're talking about. So I think part of it is you'll notice that there's a gap of some years between the man with the golden gun and the spy who loved me. And part of that was, and we touched on it a little bit last episode, and I'm sure by now many people have brought things up in the comments, but part of that was the fallout surrounding Harry Saltzman leaving Dan Jack and Eon Productions. And there were legal troubles. As we said in that article that we pulled up from the Ottawa Citizen, there were legal troubles surrounding other failed business prospects from Saltzman. And he had, and again, this is history according to the victors, because this is on the DVD being produced by Eon Productions with Broccoli's children in control of the company. But according to that, Saltzman basically put up his 50% stake in the Bond franchise as collateral for these other businesses, like a restaurant and things, that when they failed, the creditors were like, well, now we need that money and they can't just go give me 50% of James Bond. Now I, a restaurant, own that, or I, you know, (laughs) now I, an investor in a restaurant, own 50% of James Bond. And so they had to sort of disentangle everything. And it ended up with Saltzman selling his share of the stake to United Artists. And so that took some time, which is why it was a couple years before they were able to produce their next movie and so this was the first bond movie with cubby broccoli in the producer role by himself there was a lot riding on it like by all accounts this was very stressful for everyone involved and so i imagine that when they're talking about it there's a lot of that there's a lot of the sort of memory of how much they had to fight to get this movie out the door and that it may color their recollection of just how astonishing this movie is in the Bond pantheon. That could be. Whereas I don't think, to be clear, and we're going to talk about the whole movie, settle in. You know how this podcast goes. (laughs) I don't think it's bad, but I just, I don't think it's in the upper echelons of the series. To me, it's very, oh right, it's one of the Roger Moore movies between Live and Let Die and View to a Kill that's, you know, fun, if a bit silly in places, which is fine. Again, that's why I like Roger Moore, but I, I don't know. Yeah, this one doesn't fade into the blur for me and i guess we'll get into why later spoilers i might rate this one as my favorite roger moore bond movie oh interesting um so we'll see where i 
might come out too once we've had our discussion but i like i love this movie i think this movie is great now that is not to say that i think it is above reproach or that there are <laughs> things in it that are not bad has that ever been true once of any of the movies we've talked about <laughs> yeah so like there are certainly things that fall flat in this film but whereas i think that the man with the golden gun i think that movie is sort of less than the sum of its parts i think this one is probably more interesting because yeah i've definitely seen a few it's weird because of our schedule being so far ahead of producing these like recording these episodes to where they go up as you see people talking about you know oh i can't wait to hear you talk about the man with the golden gun an episode Mm -hmm. that they have not heard our thoughts on but that we have already committed (laughs) to tape essentially talking about like what a piece of garbage it is and i'm like "Uh (laughs) (laughs) uh-oh you're like oh no i have differed from the popular consensus (laughs) exactly i will be told that i am wrong on the internet yes i will be summarily routed on the court of public opinion yeah anyhow $13.5 $13.5 million, not bad in the budget. It's uh, $54 million adjusted for inflation. I did it ahead of time this week. And it made, holy moly, $184 million, almost $785 million. Whew. Doing pretty well. Like, people are not tired of James Bond. Returning director, Lewis Gilbert, who prior to this had directed You Only Live Twice, which we also quite enjoyed, and which shares more than a few similarities. Yeah. <laughs> one one or two similarities to the overall structure. Yeah, I think in a, a side conversation, like not that we had recorded previously, but just in a side conversation that you and I had, I referred to this as a stealth remake of You Only Live Twice. God, it really is, though. Yeah. (laughs) And starring Roger Moore, Barbara Bach, Kurd Jurgens, and introducing beloved recurring henchman Richard Keel as Jaws. We also have the introduction of Jeffrey Keane as Frederick Gray, the British Minister of Defense, and Walter Gotell as General Gogol, the head of the KGB, who would both appear in the next five and six films respectively which i had completely forgotten that they just kept bringing these two back it's kind of funny i guess let's start sure thing the spy who loved me is back in cinemascope aspect ratio no longer the 185 to 1 it is now the 2.2 2. 2 something to 1 gosh i can never remember cinematic aspect ratios it's really really wide <laughs> The movies went to the super wide aspect ratio mid Connery and then went back to not quite, but a more traditional widescreen of almost 16 by 9 that most TVs and monitors are these days Mm -hmm. just for Live and Let Die and Man with a Golden Gun. And now we're back to the full major Uber widescreen. I have to admit, I like the very widescreen. It does give it a very cinematic feel, particularly with like so much of Bond is about epic locations and and sweeping vistas and that sort of thing that really drives that home. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. I I love the the ultra widescreen. That also meant that they had to reshoot the gun barrel sequence. Oh, of course it would. This is now Moore's second gun barrel sequence. And in this one, he's wearing a tux. Ah, after the gun barrel sequence, the circle opens up onto the exterior of a submarine. And then we go inside the submarine. This is a British submarine. What a great set. I assume it's a set. It must be a set. Yeah. We see some men walking around inside and then there's tremors on the submarine and everybody looks very confused about that. The captain gets up to the bridge, pulls down the periscope, looks outside and just goes, my God, or something. He just reacts. He he looks astonished and then it cuts. They surface, that happens and then we cut. So we don't know what happened. And then we cut to the Ministry of Defense with, oh God, can you tell Ken Adams is back immediately just as soon as you see this room? <laughs> the set, yeah. Just as soon as you see this set, yeah. And this is kind of funny because this is, we see British Naval Officer Captain Benson. This is actually the Royal Navy's naval base in Scotland, which is a real location. Captain Benson played by George Baker, who not four films ago 
played Professor Hillary Bray from the the Coats of Arms. I yeah, thank you. The College yes. of Arms. Yes, the College of Arms. Also, wow, I didn't know that. And you're totally right. It is. Yeah, that's that's amazing. He gets word that the the submarine has gone missing. And we then cut over to Moscow, where General <laughs> Google Gogol? General Gogol also receives a call and learns that a Russian sub has gone missing. Now, you'll remember Walter Gotell. He appeared as Morzini in From Russia with Love. And you and I were both like, where have we seen this guy? And then looked it up and realized, oh, right, he's General Gogol later on. Yeah, and he will be back many, many times. Yeah. Speaking of amazing sets, his office is so... <laughs> It's I love it. It's meant to be like a orthodox cathedral, but it's yeah. just it's nothing but columns and then a solitary chair in a light. <laughs> and it's so funny. It's very Spartan. There's it's like his ornate desk with all of its adornments and his red phone. And then just this empty gray concrete room with one window and one chair in the background. So he receives word that one of their submarines has gone missing and they're going to put their best agent onto it. And he puts out the call to get a hold of Agent Triple X. And we then cut to a hotel room and there's a man and a woman making love. The camera closes in on the man as he rolls over. The man we assume is Russian Agent Triple X, unless you've seen any of the trailers or TV spots for the movie. But, it, you know, don't <laughs> don't worry about that. They chat for a bit. They obviously are both involved in some way in working for the Russian government. And he says that he has to leave because he needs to be in Austria tomorrow. And then the radio comes in and goes like, come in, come in, Agent Triple X. And the man flips up the radio to respond and then sort of adjusts how he's sitting so that he can sit up in bed and respond to the radio, except that's not what's happening. He's moving out of the way so that Agent Triple X, played by Barbara Bach, can respond to the radio. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. I like the scene. I, I, I like the the fake out i think it's cute no it is even though it's like not even remotely something that they would have kept secret as you say if you've seen any of the posters or any of the trailers or what have you i think they're them playing coy about which one is agent triple x is cute oh yeah no it is a fun little bit barbara bach aka lady starkey because she From is game of thronies <laughs> <laughs> so do you do you know why if she's lady starkey do you know who sir starkey is <laughs> sean beanie <laughs> sir <laughs> sir richard starkey aka ringo star oh oh yeah yeah she's she's married to ringo so that's why she's technically lady starkey because they don't knight you with your stage name <laughs> right yeah <laughs> okay yeah cool so there you go barbara bach aka i mean not at the, not at this time i don't think maybe i'm wrong i don't actually know when they got married it doesn't matter we cut to m's office <laughs> we do cut to m's office and he's on the phone with the minister of defense learning that a submarine has gone missing and so he also says we'll get our best agent on it he walks out to money penny's office and says do you know where 007 is to which she responds, oh, he's on a mission in Austria. To which M responds, tell him to pull out immediately. Oh, God, M, you're just, you set him up for these. Like, <laughs> it's like you don't even know who you're talking about. So, of course, we cut to Austria where James Bond is making love with a woman. In just the coziest looking log cabin beside an enormous fireplace. This is so quintessential. Massive fur rug in a log cabin. Yeah, they get it on. Bond, of course, gets the message. We get a great little gadget situation where he has a label printer built into his watch and so he hears his watch printing out a message and he looks down it says 007 to report hq immediately like one of those little like the label printers that has like like punches the letters into a piece of plastic yeah is somehow inside his watch it's amazing yeah with that he throws on some pants apologizes to the woman but is like nope sorry England calls. I gotta go. He heads out the door. Of course, he is in the Austrian Alps, so he, he's got his ski suit on. He hops on a pair of skis. No sooner than moments after he has closed the door, the woman is on her little radio communicator to some other agents who are patrolling the mountainside to say he's on his way so you can pursue. And we cut into a ski pursuit. 
And Graham, you know how much I love ski pursuits. Oh, you love a good ski pursuit. I love a good ski pursuit. In this one, James Bond in his bright yellow and red ski suit is being pursued by four agents, presumably Russian, as we will learn, they are definitely Russian, as he skis his way down the Austrian Alps. It's a pretty sweet scene. They've got machine guns. Well, they've got assault rifles and they're chasing him and shooting at him and he's skiing his best. He has a ski pole gun. All in all, I think that this ski scene, like we get a lot of skiing, like wide shots of skiing, which is awesome. Like the skiing is great. The major stunt here is all the terrain right like the actual skiing he doesn't do that much Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't see in like a a standard skiing video but the terrain is really varied and different and so you get lots of fun stuff of him like dodging around obstacles or going through little ice tunnels the big stunt i assume here is when he turns backwards and skis backwards and lines up one of the guys and shoots him with the gun built into his pole Hmm. I imagine that wasn't that like that was something that was quite special in the moment. Nowadays, the little tots and the bunny hill ski backwards. But at the time, back in 1977, I imagine that wasn't super common just because skis were not typically built for it. This was, of course, they got Willie Bogner back to do a lot of the ski stunts and the ski photography, but not the most impressive ski stunt at the very end of the opening titles which sees Bond fly off a sheer cliff and as he falls, unhook his skis that go tumbling away from him Mm -hmm. and he pulls a parachute and parachutes away. But not just any parachute. Oh, there's so much to talk about here. So the parachute looks like the Union Jack. It's actually a slightly incorrect Union Jack, but apparently this absolutely brought the house down when it premiered and is largely credited for a sort of an almost a turning of the tide of people from England like really claiming James Bond as their own. Right. You know, this was when it was like, you know, despite the fact that he's in previous movies, he's literally raised a glass to a painting of the queen. <laughs> this <laughs> this was like, like, hell yeah, go England. Hey. So Willie Bogner did not perform that particular stunt that was performed by a man named Rick Sylvester, who the producers had seen a magazine article about him essentially base jumping off of half dome in yosemite Mm. as i mentioned in the live and let die when it was like oh hang gliding get the guy who invented hang gliding get him over here and get him to do it so they saw this article they were like well get that guy you know they were like well no one can do this obviously well obviously that guy did okay we'll get that guy and it turns out (laughs) according to him he had not in fact done what that article said he had done Oh, no. (laughs) He was like, so I haven't actually done that, but I can, and I know exactly where to do it. (laughs) The eagle-eyed among you will notice in the end credits that there is thanks to Parks Canada. I did notice that. Yeah, because this scene, just this jump, was shot on Baffin Island. Really? Yeah. Asgard Peak was the location, because it's a supremely tall sheer drop of a cliff that you can only get to by helicopter this was actually shot in uh july 1976 a month before other principal photography because they were like well i'll tell you what head out there see if you can do it if you can't we have enough time to figure out a different stunt right give it a shot yes throw yourself off this cliff for our amusement hopefully it works out (laughs) (laughs) so rick sylvester the the stunt performer and second unit director john glenn who we've mentioned previously as second unit director on You Only Live Twice, and he would fully direct some movies later, went out there, stayed in what would now be none of it for 10 days waiting for the right weather conditions (laughs) with the producers back home getting more and more concerned that they hadn't heard anything. And then finally did it. They had, I think they said five or six cameras on the stunt. Most of them lost him. (laughs) Oh no. Except for one that is the shot that we see the unbroken shot that followed him off the cliff the whole way down until the shoot pulls yeah i mean props to that camera op <laughs> such such a great stunt i hope the camera op got a bonus oh yeah it, it this stunt is 10 times cooler because it is one long unbroken shot of the stunt if they had had to cut from camera angle to camera angle it would not sell nearly as well as it does yeah but it's so good and it's such an amazing s- scenery as well like it's just phenomenal so then it cuts from the shot of bond with the union jack parachute into the opening titles and sucks all the energy out of the scene holy moly does it ever (laughs) i i imagine the only reason 
that this <laughs> that this doesn't come up in in conversations about that first time that they showed the movie is because the whole house was giving a standing ovation to the stunt and didn't notice. So in the <laughs> Matt Wiggins unifying theory of Bond opening title songs, yeah, while there will be some bleed over in the borders between categories, yes, I think you'll find going forward that generally speaking, I will be favoring bangers over belters over ballads i yeah this being a ballad is not not one of my favorite songs no and to a certain extent few caveats here one i think this is a good song yeah i'm not crazy about it as a bond theme but i think it's actually a pretty good song i feel for the writer of the song because i mean nowadays it's like all right well we know what the name of the movie is and they go and they i mean probably back at the time too it's like we'll go find a notable musician or you know we'll solicit entries from a number of different famous musicians and then pick the one that we think has the best legs and with a name like the spy who loved me you're operating at a bit of a disadvantage in terms of like making that the primary lyric in your song Mm -hmm. and so props to the songwriters here for even getting the title of the movie into the song because it is in there yeah lyrics by carol bayer sager music composed not just for this but for the whole movie music by marvin hamlish ah song performed by carly simon i don't know it's fine it it sucks all the energy out of that stunt as the movie slows to a crawl for two and a half minutes and then we get back into like get back into it the one thing i will say i actually like the visuals in this one quite a lot though so there's some aspects that i quite like there's a few shots that are a little less silhouette there's some stuff with guns being gymnastics bars which is kind of cool yes i like that quite a lot but there's also a lot of like literally reusing the same silhouettes from previous movies like the hands that come in at the (laughs) beginning this is definitely peak bender again fair enough so some of the silhouette stuff is is like new and fun and i like it and i like what they're doing with it i like the focus on like roger moore and like bringing his face into it a bit i love using the gun barrels as gymnastics bars i think that's rad Mm -hmm. and i think it's used well there's like the motif of like bond being bond in this opening and the women being russian agents which i like towards the end there's the like the line of marching ladies which is the same shot duplicated over and over again but like i like it it's cool i don't know i i like this one a lot more than i have liked several of the previous ones from a visual point of view it's just more arresting visually i guess even if there is a lot of reuse fair enough i should add marvin hamlish is one of only 16 people with the full egot oh the emmy grammy oscar and tony he he got there he got there indeed he gets kind of cute with some of the music in this movie but i guess we'll talk about it more when it's relevant it's true after the opening titles we come back in on general gogol's office and agent triple x reports for briefing the brief is that one of their submarines has been disappeared and it's her job to find out what in the hell happened to it also he mentions that i don't remember the guy's name or rank the man that she was with in the pre-title has been killed in action in austria so the audience is now putting two and two together it's like wait a minute he was one of the guys skiing after bond that bond killed with his ridiculous ski pole gun i can't remember exactly how she reacts to it but she basically says that she wants to find out who killed him so she can take revenge yeah she holds her own she's clearly upset but she basically is just like please keep me informed of any developments in the investigation with the clear intent being that she's going to find whoever did it and kill them yeah yeah i one of the now's as good a time to get into it as any one of my and issues is a strong word but (laughs) one of the marks where this movie doesn't quite shine for me is barbara bach as agent triple x okay i like her just fine but she doesn't land for me as an equal of james bond but russian Mm. i think it's in her delivery she has this very quiet ethereal voice it sounds like she's dubbed she's not but it sounds like she's dubbed (laughs) there's a lot of moments where 
I just, I want more emotion from her, more power behind her words. And I have difficulty buying her as the astounding Russian agent. Okay. To me, she does not have the presence, the like... I can see that. Walk into a room commanding presence that you expect from a James Bond equal, regardless of gender. That's irrelevant. Right. Whereas I like, I am sort of willing to buy it. Okay. I agree with you. I like to the extent that I am able to agree with you. <laughs> I I agree with you. I buy it a little bit because just by nature of being a female spy at this in this era, her strengths and weaknesses as an agent are going to be different from those of Bond. I don't necessarily think that she needs to command a room in order to be as effective an agent, but at least not in the same way. So that's actually sort of related to my other complaint, which is not directed at Barbara Bach, who, by the way, was cast four days before principal photography started, <laughs> but at the movie. So they're setting it up that it's like we've got James Bond and Anya Amasova and they are going to be going back and forth head to head throughout this movie. For the first half of the movie when it's social engineering, chicanery and subterfuge and that sort of stuff, they hold their own with each other very well. Mm -hmm. And then the latter half of the movie, the script just fails her entirely. Yeah. The latter half of the movie is just her screaming for James to do something. Yeah. And I was really let down by that and that's not a criticism of her that's of the writing and i guess the directing as well of of the movie that like because also in these dvd features they're talking about how great it is that they're you know such perfect equals matching each other step by step and i'm like i just watched a movie where that's not true <laughs> that's totally fair for the big action scenes, they basically write her out of them. Yeah, the entire scene in the Lotus Esprit is just her looking behind them and going, James! Yes, and then, and then once once James is on the ship, she's elsewhere. Like, she's just removed from the scene, so she has nothing to contribute. Let her, like, fire off some gadgets or something. Yeah, so, yes, again, I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> I think, actually, in my opinion, the biggest failure of the script comes right at the end. So there's, like, there's a lot I like in this picture over the course of the movie but the biggest failure for me comes right at the end i'm willing to buy it is a james bond movie so i am willing to buy again willing to buy the idea that the russian spy who is ostensibly bond's rival gets written out of the big action set piece in such a way as to focus on what bond is doing at that point in the movie but what i'm not willing to buy is that the resolution to all the tension that the film has been building up around the fact that she knows like well she learns over the course of the movie that bond was responsible for her lover's death that she just lets him off the hook yeah that i think is the biggest failure of this storyline yep she's just well, now we're straight skipping to the end of the movie but she's like all right i said at the end of this mission i was going to kill you and he is like well can i have one last request let's get out of these wet things and she just laughs and puts the gun down come on we've got room for one final confrontation we can still have a satisfying resolution to that conflict it doesn't have to be an action sequence but it needs to be something more than okay <laughs> right <laughs> uh, so we go now back in the the chronology of the movie we go back to the fast lane naval base in scotland and this is where i want to shout out a m different member of the production team which is cinematographer cloud renoir uh grandson by the way of the painter renoir oh yeah there's a couple great shots particularly the one of bond and frederick gray the minister of defense walking along the dock as a submarine goes in the background but i, I haven't talked much about cinematography thus far with the exception of ohmss which was the one that wasn't shot like checks notes all the other movies we've seen so far mm -hmm. because all the other movies we've seen so far were shot very normally i don't know how better to describe it but they were they were not necessarily going for interesting photography whereas this one does which is i think why ohmss felt so out of place in its time this one is shot much more like a modern movie with interesting framing and creative shots more than just enter room shoulder 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 leave mm -hmm. and there's some really really excellent shots in this movie but commander bond enters the fast lane naval base q is there and so is as i mentioned frederick gray minister of defense and amusingly vice admiral hargreaves flag officer submarines of the royal navy 
I'm reading here from my notes. <laughs> <laughs> played by Robert Brown, who would play M in the four films that precede Goldeneye. Oh. So this is the guy that plays M after Bernard Lee passed away. Right. So in Octopussy, View to a Kill, Living Daylights, and License to Kill, M is played by Robert Brown. I don't know if it's meant to be that Vice Admiral Hargreaves is just taking over the role, or if it's a... I, I don't know if it's meant to be the same character played by a different actor, because they call him M, which originally in the novels is because of the character's name right not actually a code name but then the movies just sort of made it that like well major boothroyd is q and the guy in charge is m and so maybe this you know it's unclear but we'll see more of this guy later anyway the briefing there's this ridiculous thing where a map comes out of the wall it's so good he punches some buttons on the computer and shows this is the route of the nuclear submarine and the only people who knew about this were the captain of the sub and like two other people and then what do you have there james bond James puts this thing up onto the map and it's the same layout as the path of the submarine. How did whoever did whatever to the submarine? Because they still don't know. How did whoever is responsible find out the path that the submarine was going to be on? How did they know its course? Bond has to figure out how that information was leaked, who has it, and to stop it. And there's a bit where Q is like, oh yeah, you know, because they say, it's, you know, these are totally untraceable. And Q's like, oh no, no, you could trace them. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You just sort of, you know, track the heat signature and then you'd be able to figure it out. And they're like, Q, can you like shut up? <laughs> <laughs> we go to the awesome exterior shot that you talked about and that is where we learn from the minister of defense that the submarine that has gone missing was loaded up with nuclear missiles oh right we don't actually know it's nuclear until this point that's right so right. we find out that it's it's loaded up with polaris missiles that now the missiles of course have fallen into unknown hands and that there is a contact that bond will need to pursue in egypt that's it. We know that there's a contact. They, they've they got some intelligence indicating that the owners of the tracing device that allowed them to track the sub are trying to sell the device on the black market in Egypt. Right. Then, sort of for no reason that it seems, we cut to a dining room. It's got a huge, great table. It's got massive tapestries on the wall, a fireplace at the end. There's a woman at one end of the table and a man at the other end of the table. And the man at the other end of the table is Carl Stromberg, who will be end up being the bad guy of this movie, played by Kurt Jurgens, credited as Kurt Jurgens, because I guess they thought Kurt Jurgens was difficult to say i i don't know if you're paying attention you will notice in a couple shots that stromberg has webbed hands he sure does yeah because he likes the sea anyway these two men in suits are shown in and he congratulates them for their work on nuclear stuff basically he it's nothing is really specified he's just sort of like you you've both done great work thank you so much 10 million dollars has been wired to each of your swiss bank accounts it's been a pleasure working with you goodbye although before you leave someone has been leaking your information and been selling it and i know who it is so before he starts laying into these two he asks the woman at the end of the table like okay could you actually just leave us to this for a moment and she sort of is like okay sure and stands up and goes over gets into the gets into the elevator and as soon as she's in the elevator stromberg pushes a button a screen comes up showing his shark tank that's right it's another bad guy with sharks this is three this is the third <laughs> bond villain with a tank of sharks Yes, but <laughs> the first Bond villain with a trap door in the elevator. Yeah, Connery and Diamonds Are Forever would have been ready for this, but he <laughs> hits a button, trap door in the elevator goes, and the woman goes, boom, falls through a tube, lands in the giant shark tank, and is eaten as the two horrified scientists watch on. And he then says, anyway, don't cross me, and bids them leave. They look very nervous getting into the elevator. I love it. They look so nervous. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you be? I'd be incredibly nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think they like they walk up to the elevator and like one of them like stops the other one from getting on for a moment before they look at the floor to like examine the floor to make sure it's safe. Uh, I'm sorry, Graham. I love this movie. <laughs> After they leave, he presses another button and all the tapestries go up, showing that the room is actually underwater. And then we cut to an exterior shot of this structure 
rising out of the ocean and it's intercut with shots inside of the the room the dining room that stromberg is in rising out of the sea as this enormous four-legged science fiction looking like thunderbirds looking miniature <laughs> rises out of the water i say i say thunderbirds looking miniature as if visual effects supervisor derek meddings who worked on the miniatures didn't literally do work for the anderson's <laughs> super marionation <laughs> series like he he worked on like stingray and fireball xl5 and stuff like that so it's of like of course it yeah. looks like thunderbirds i uh, i'm sorry i gotta gush over this model <laughs> i love this base it's great it's so ridiculous I love it. I love the miniature work. I think the miniature is awesome. I think the presentation of it rising out of the sea with the like the classical music is just delightful to watch. If you if you ever wondered where The Incredibles got a lot of its visual inspiration from, look no further. Everything about the sets we've seen so far, the ridiculous, ornate, classical dining room inside this incredibly utilitarian looking structure. I love it. This is one of my if not my absolute favorite Bond villain lair in any of the Bond movies. It's so absurd. <laughs> it's utterly, <laughs> utterly absurd. This was Ken Adams self-admittedly experimenting with roundness. Because <laughs> so much of his uh, sets are very clean lines, but... I love it. And, and it's like absurd, but in the good way for me sometimes i bag on these movies for feeling like unwitting self parody this doesn't quite hit that line for me this is the kind of thing that the parody movies parody intentionally but this is just like hitting the perfect level of james bond excess without stepping over the line i think i read it a little differently i think this is witting self parody <laughs> <laughs> i think witting self parody is totally it totally reasonable. I think this is very silly. After the movie finished, Kathleen asked me, so how was this one? And I was like, that's a silly movie. It It is. And I like, I think you're right. I like, I think it's like knowingly silly. I don't think it's trying oh, to no. not be. Absolutely. But I, but I don't think it's so silly. I like, I, I don't even know what to qualify that statement with. Right. Like mm -hmm. there's a point where a movie is, oh, that was so silly. And it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that was silly. But I had a great time with all the silliness. This is like the silliness done right as compared to some of the movies jumping the shark with it. And despite there being sharks and jumps, I don't think this movie does either. Yeah, that's fair. Like, I, I also think that this this lair is amazing. Like, if <laughs> I'm not out here to criticize this when I was like all over the one that was inside a volcano, don't worry, I'm with you on this. <laughs> So it rises from the sea. Yeah, before it is finished rising from the sea, Stromberg calls in two henchmen to his room. Henchman number one, we already mentioned, the beloved and oft-referenced Jaws, played by the seven-foot-two Richard Keel, who, I mean, gosh, was in so many movies. I mean, probably the most memorable being Jaws in The Spy Who Loved Me and also Moonraker. But he also had a role in Happy Gilmore. He sure did. And one of his earliest roles was the character Ega in the movie Ega, <laughs> which is known to fans of Mystery Science Theater 3000 as the one where watch out for snakes comes from. <laughs> but also there's another guy. Did you know there were two henchmen in this movie? You may be surprised to discover that there's actually a second guy. <laughs> I did. And he's also great, although he doesn't get he doesn't get the same kind of reputation as Jaws. No. He's Sandor, played by Milton Reed, who... So it doesn't help that he's standing beside Richard Keel, because he looks very, very small. But in a fight scene later, we'll discover that he is the same height as Roger Moore, just the width of a fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Milton Reed also played a guard in Dr. No and a guard in... 1967's Casino Royale. Oh, yeah. all right. Stromberg gives them both the same mission, which is get out there, find out who has access to the courses of these submarines and make sure that no one has access to them anymore. It's the plans to build the tracking device. Right. Yes, the tracking device that they're using. In the wild. Yeah. yeah. So he says, go find anyone who has had contact with the, the microfilm and kill them and retrieve the microfilm and bring it back. 
There's a couple great shots that mesh miniature and matte photography with actual film. Like there's this shot of them getting on the plane that then like pans up into a matte painting and then also a shot of Stromberg looking out the window of his dining room. It's really well done. Like some of the visual effects in this movie are very, very clever. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I love that matte painting and like that whole camera pan is so good. It really sells the realism of this thing, which is just, which is a miniature. Like obviously they didn't build this thing. It's a huge miniature. It's like the size of a car, but it's a miniature. There was a real place that they were considering filming that did rise up and out of the ground. It was in Japan. It was like their ocean discovery lab or something that was built for the World's Fair. And then they just decided to do it in miniature. And unfortunately, that place doesn't exist anymore because it sounds really cool. Stromberg goes down into his sort of lower sanctum, I guess. And after the two scientists have taken off in the helicopter and we get the requisite shot of them shaking hands with one another and smiling, he blows up the helicopter. (laughs) And cancels their $10 million payments. And tells them to inform next of kin that there was a horrible helicopter accident. It would have been so much cheaper for you to just put them into the shark tank. (laughs) But (laughs) But way less dramatic. What I want to know is why are you informing the next of kin that there's been a terrible helicopter accident? Because would the next of kin then not want to collect on the $10 million? Whereas if they just disappear at sea unexpectedly and nobody ever comments on it. Presumably they didn't know. I think the point of letting them get in the... I'm being kind here. The point of letting them get in the helicopter is that so there is wreckage and so that they can be Mm. like, oh, look, rather than just they never go home. Fair enough. From a writing point of view, this seems like a weird... Like, it's a character line, I guess, but it's still like a weird line to put in the movie. What if they just didn't have next of kin? Oh, geez, they blew up. How sad. Cancel the $10 million payments. What's next on the agenda is a little more, like, evil. Yeah. (laughs) But I guess they're going for the sort of like gentleman Dr. Evil here. So it that's fine. We cut to Bond on a camel being led through the desert by another man on another camel because he's going to meet up with an old college friend of his who now in well, I mean, he is a sheik, but he, he also went to Cambridge with Bond. So he's come to his amazing tent near an oasis to ask him for a favor. This scene is completely inconsequential, so I'm just sort of breezing through it. This this scene is totally gratuitous. He comes in, he chats with him for a while, they catch up, he is offered a woman to spend the night with, he agrees, he is told the name of his contact that he needs to meet. So the next day, we see this wide shot of Cairo. There's a really cool shot of Bond walking down corridors of columns. There's a cool shot where he's in silhouette from some distance. There's just like really interesting photography, which I'm enjoying. So he goes to his contact's house. The contact is a man named Fekish, who never gets to talk or do anything in this movie. (laughs) Bond looks for him. A woman comes out and goes, oh, he's not here right now. And he's like, oh, where is he? I can't tell you. Well, I don't trust you. I want information. And it's she sort of offers herself as a distraction. He knows something is up. And we see some intercut shots of Sandor on the mezzanine taking aim at Bond. She apparently doesn't know about that because she sees Sandor screams Bond spins around she gets shot and then he chases off after Sandor and they have a pretty brutal fight on the roof of this building which is this is where you find out that he's the same height as Bond he's just like three Bonds wide so this fight is great yeah I love this action scene I love every action scene this is a great fight they throw each other around the the roof this is the requisite fight scene where Bond gets absolutely worked over from beginning to end uh- <laughs> He uh, he manages to get a few socks in, but Sandor is another one of those sort of like remarkably sturdy enemies, whereas Bond can often take out many a villain with a single judo chop or well-placed punch that, that doesn't work on Sandor. Yeah, Bond takes his licks in this one. The fight ultimately ends at the edge of a rooftop when Bond manages sort to sort of like knock Sandor back and he ends up leaned up against the edge of this roof, losing his balance and he reaches out and grabs Bond's tie and uses his tie to hold himself up to keep from falling off the building. Bond then questions him about where Fakesh is, how he can meet him. Sandor answers, he's like, at the pyramids! And Bond then just knocks the tie out of his hand causing him to fall to his death at the bottom of the building so that's why you don't hear much about sandor because that's that's all that sandor does so then we cut to the pyramids kind of we cut to oh what was this 
called? It's called We Cut to This Sound and Light Show slash history lesson about the pyramids and the Sphinx and everything. And this was a real show that ran in Cairo for many years. And so there's music and different lights. And so when they're talking about the Sphinx, the lights come up on the Sphinx and everything. It doesn't look like this. <laughs> Speaking of the optical effects, there's a lot of weirdness going on in this scene, but the, the foreground elements of the Sphinx and the ruins and the illumination and everything and all the people sitting in chairs, that's all there. And the pyramids in the background are models that are right. composited in. And there's even the shot where Bond is approaching the group sitting down. There's a long shot of him walking down a sand dune towards the group. And the people in the foreground sitting in chairs are matte painting. If you freeze frame it, it's really obvious. Yes, I I kind of love it because there's a there's like a motion element mm -hmm. in the matte painting as well yeah if you're watching it in motion you can see like where their hands are there's like something is moving to make it look like there's motion in the crowd and it's not just a still crowd but it's like super obviously a painting mm -hmm. bond walks along the assembled crowd sitting in their chairs watching the show until he spots Fekish, who he recognizes from a photo that he saw at Fekish's apartment because Fekish, like all normal people just has a framed four by six photo of himself sitting around his house he is talking to someone. He's talking to who we know is Anya, but Bond doesn't know who that is. So they sort of talk for a bit and Fekish spots Jaws standing in the shadows because he gets he gets illuminated by one of the lights that comes up. If you, by the way, just for those at home, if you watch this sequence with the knowledge that at no point is there a real pyramid visible in these shots, it's kind of impressive because there's like shots where they're out of focus in the background, like up in the corner. There's one of the shots of Jaws where they're illuminated with light and it's it's very well composited together. Mm -hmm. So Fekish sees Jaws, excuses himself. Bond pursues Fekish. He runs away from Jaws and goes and hides in one of the tombs. There's this, speaking of the compositing, there's this wide shot of Bond hiding behind a rock while Jaws runs after Fekish because Bond has spotted Jaws now. The Sphinx's head is visible in the background and the pyramid is visible in the background. So the skyline is all added in, but so is the shot of Bond in the foreground. <laughs> they didn't even film it. That is a pro <laughs> that is a production photo of Roger Moore from like the marketing department. <laughs> it is a still image that they arted in there because they didn't have the footage of Bond hiding behind a rock. Oh, that's great. It's so good. It just worked really, really well. So anyway, Bond follows. He watches Fekish unlock and then relock the chain on someone's tomb, some ancient Egyptian tomb, and run inside. Jaws runs up, bites through the chain, which is Love it. made of licorice. Jaws can chew through chains. We just sort of don't worry about the bite strength required, it's all in the teeth. Don't worry about it. I mean, he's got metal teeth, yeah. right? That's got to count for something. He's also enormous. But anyway, so he goes inside, grabs Fekish, and it looks like Jaws kills people by biting part of their neck out, like the, the jugular, I guess, because he just sort of goes in like a vampire and then Fekish is dead. So after Jaws leaves... Bond runs in. Well, he actually has a little bit of an encounter with Jaws as he comes out, but then the lights go down. And when the lights come back up, Jaws is gone. So Bond goes in, looks at Fekish's body. He finds a little notebook that has a message to meet Max Kalba in the Mujaba Club at 940. Doesn't check anything else that this guy might have. Just is like, <laughs> that's good enough for me. He goes outside and Anya's waiting there and she sets two goons on him and he defeats the two goons. It's very like send the putties after him moment mm -hmm. and then he just sort of is like okay cool well goodbye <laughs> <laughs> and and leaves and then we cut to the club all right so before we cut to the club yeah a couple of things about this whole sequence i love how all the way through this sequence it is being soundtracked by the like light and sound show i do like that a lot it is all diegetic but it it happens to be that all the musical stings and everything hit right at like perfect dramatic moments. Hey, quick film studies lesson for those listening at home. What does diegetic mean in this case? 
that it exists in the world of the film. Yeah. So the characters can hear it too. I love it. Yeah. So like most of the music in Bond movies, except when we're in clubs and somebody's actually performing music is non-diegetic. So you like get the Bond theme playing when there is a, a major action scene happening. That is not the case with the music in this scene, which is all taking place in the world and just is edited in such a way that it lines up with all the dramatic events, as do the lighting changes and whatnot, because all the lighting in this scene is awesome it's just brightly colored lights it gives adds a ton of visual interest to the scene this whole scene is super dramatic i i love how it's presented even the silly bits if you ever wondered by the way where the egyptian level came from in goldeneye 64 mm. the room in which fakesh is killed is like straight out of the video game there's a shot of like columns in one of the shots that is straight from another one of the rooms in that level. There's your inspiration. That's what they were drawing from when they were building this level, I believe. Mm -hmm. This whole sequence is super sweet. There's not a lot of dialogue other than just like the announcer of the show talking. The whole thing has dramatic weight. It's exciting. It's presented in a visually interesting way for like a really straightforward. I think this whole sequence is great. I agree. I think it's super fun. And I, I love how they use the music and light of the show in the pacing and editing of the scene. I think it's really clever. We go to the nightclub, which looks amazing. Bond enters wearing a tux, and then he notices that Anya is also there wearing an astonishing dress. He doesn't try to hide it or anything. He's like, ah, we're probably both here for the same thing. Can I buy you a drink? And then they make it clear to one another that they both know each other's favorite drink because they both know who each other is immediately. They're both like, you drink this and you drink this. By the way, Bond is back on the vodka martini, shaken, not stirred. The neat bourbon only lasted two movies, I think. Maybe even just the one movie. I don't know. Did he order? I think it was just the one. I think it was just the one, yeah. He also hasn't been seen smoking at a gigantic cigar. They'll come back. <laughs> the gigantic cigars will definitely return. One of the things we get in this one, not only do they order each other's drinks, but they basically like lay out who one another is. She sort of drives Bond away by going through his whole personal history. She gets to the point where she's like going through his entire personal history. It's like, oh, you're James Bond, graduated Cambridge, you're commander in the British Navy, you were married once and bond is like mm, that's about enough of that and like gets up and leaves yeah as soon as she <laughs> says married once he's like mm, 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 no we're not talking about that which would be the first of several references to ohmss throughout future movies which is kind of cool yeah I like that despite Diamonds Are Forever trying to pretend that that movie didn't happen, that they did not necessarily just completely decanonize the events of the film. Mm -hmm. Originally, they wanted to have Blofeld be the bad guy in this movie. Right, that makes sense. But the, pardon the pun, the specter of Kevin McClory reared his ugly head again and <laughs> the legal ramifications thereof. And we talked about that before, that eventually they would all be back under the same roof, but Blofeld and Spectre would not appear for many, many, many years in the mainline franchise. This is more sort of responding directly to YouTube comments again, but so I'm a Star Trek fan. Really? And shocking, I know. So please believe <laughs> that I understand how fun it is to make sure that everything fits neatly into a timeline. I get it. I also enjoy doing that. That doesn't work for Bond. And we've said it several times. These movies are not meant to to have continuity. In fact, I think it's fair to say that Matt and I agree that when they do have direct continuity, it is to the disservice of the movies. If you want to have a theory that James Bond is always the same person, but he is having reconstructive surgery between movies, or if you want to think that James Bond 007 is a moniker that is passed down between different people, then that's also super cool. We are of the mind that it doesn't matter. Each of these movies is a self-contained thing. Each of the Roger Moore movies could be a self-contained universe, even when they make references. That's not what these movies are. And I feel like you'll be able to enjoy them more if you don't try to hyper-focus on making it all air quotes, make sense. Just take each movie as they come. I, I don't get the impression that they were made with the intent of them having any explicit continuity, except insofar as they are all stories that happen to James Bond over the course of his career. And some of them sort of happen before or after others, but that is as far as the continuity goes. And the before and after and what 
what's canon to what movie is totally contradictory from film to film. They are all just little like this is an adventure that happened to James Bond at some point. Mm -hmm. But I do like that they made that particular reference. So Bond excuses himself before the drinks have even arrived and goes looking for Max Calba, who he finds out is actually the owner of the club. And he goes and sits down beside him. Calba says, I thought I was meeting with feckish and bond is like nope he couldn't make it i'm here now i want to buy whatever it is that you want to buy anya comes over and says but i also would like to buy this thing brings their drinks over and he's like ah well then we're gonna have to start the bidding i suppose there's a brief intercut of a telephone repairman in a truck pulling up outside who is jaws a comically large telephone repairman <laughs> yep <laughs> And before the bidding can commence, Kalba is called away on a very important phone call, which it turns out is Jaws hiding in the area where all the phones are. As the music reaches a fever pitch, he demands the microfilm and also kills Kalba and makes his escape. Kalba's face facing his death is also great. Yeah. You can tell he's afraid, but it looks like the wrong kind of fear for what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. Bond has just finished his drink and asks Anya if she would like another. She says no, and he gets up anyway, but he's not going to get his drink. He's looking for Kalba because it's been a few minutes. He finds Kalba dead and the microfilm gone, notices that there's an open window, goes to pursue whoever did this and ran off with the microfilm. Not before grabbing an out of order sign off of one of the busted <laughs> telephone boxes and laying it on Kalba. <laughs> I love it. Mentally making a note of that for when we talk about Bond moments in the movie later. Oh, yeah. I, I think that is like almost certainly number one yeah. for this film. So he sees Jaws running away and takes off after him. Jaws doesn't know he's being pursued. Bond is stealthy and sneaks up to the phone repair truck, hides in the back. It's one of the ones where there's like the two front seats and then a bulkhead, and then in the back where all the tools are. So Jaws doesn't notice that Bond's sneaking in. He also doesn't notice when Anya also catches up with the truck and also sneaks in, except that he absolutely does because he has it wired for sound and can hear them talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like this is where the like the rivalry between agent triple x and bond really sets in mm -hmm. i think they do a great job with the rivalry yeah for all the failings of this particular plot line towards the end of the film i think the rivalry between those two characters is fabulous they are agents of rival agencies both trying to get the same objective barely tolerating each other but with no reason to like kill each other until either one of them has the microfilm and needs to take it from the other and so they just they're not helping each other but they're not getting in each other's way really and they're just sort of like having this tete a tete of sniping back and forth at one another it's great yeah i love it jaws drives from cairo to karnak which i checked and would take about eight hours so all right fair enough bond and anya fall asleep <laughs> in the back of the car <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because he arrives at this temple and this temple is actually like three different temples. Ah, right. This is where the shot of the columns are that they lifted for GoldenEye 64. Yeah, which is, I mean, uh, very in keeping with the movie because it's... Uh... I had them written. The Temple of Karnak is one of them. There's a couple different temples. There's three different temples that they just sort of combine into the temple that they are parked at. There's then this entertaining sequence with Bond and Anya trying to pursue Jaws, who knows they are there, but is trying not to let on while walking around this temple, sort of trying to also lose them and get the drop on them. Again, some really interesting photography in this shot, like cool long shots in interesting angles it's what a refreshing movie visually mm -hmm. so they both lose him and eventually he tries to get the literal drop on them by i mean dropping a stone on them they fight back and forth and jaws swings a piece of wood at bond causing a bunch of stones to fall down on top of him now this is after i sorry i've confused myself this is after anya got the microfilm from jaws at gunpoint and then there was, there's a brief scuffle and she just grabs the microfilm and takes off leaving bond to deal with jaws himself bond manages to sort of trick jaws into taking himself out but we see jaws's hand rise up out of the rubble anya runs back to the truck and realizes is that she can't start it because before they ran in there, Bond grabbed the keys. <laughs> so he gets in the car, grabs the microfilm, and then tells her to drive. But Jaws is still very much alive and starts peeling the truck open like a can. <laughs> 
I love it. Here's the thing about Jaws. He's preposterously strong and basically unkillable. Yeah. There are things that happen to Jaws in this movie that should absolutely kill anybody. And he just dusts his jacket off and keeps going. Yeah. Jaws is so much fun. Oh, yeah. I I adore Jaws. I wish he'd shown up more than in just the two movies he does. Same. But he would have gotten tired if he had. I have this. I mean, lots of people have this philosophy about additions to stories and things like that. But the the right point to leave something alone is the point at which you want more. Mm -hmm. Right. Like die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain if they had kept using him he would have gotten so tired the shtick would have like just been done so i i wish we had gotten more jaws but also i'm glad we didn't because he never wears out his welcome it would have been fun to see him return like a much later movie because he's in this one and then the next one and it would have been cool to have you know a third beat several movies in the future but i completely agree (laughs) jaws in skyfall that would have been surprising. <laughs> so after a bit of business with running him over and slamming him into a wall with the truck, they make their escape just across the desert until the truck eventually gives up and breaks down. They strike out across the desert with the score of Lawrence of Arabia playing in the background. Yep. Which apparently was put in there originally as an editing joke, but everyone loved it so much that they they ended up keeping it. It's a good joke. It is a good joke. I love the marching band music as they're making their way across the desert in this like rickety beaten up van as well that has like had the roof torn off of it and one of the side panels torn off of it. One of the doors is hanging loose, a fender's hanging loose. This is a f- all of the scenes in this movie are fun. I'm sorry, I'm gushing about this movie a lot, but I just I have so much fun watching this movie. All the way through they eventually arrive at the banks of the river nile where a boat is just preparing to set off and and bond motions to the captain of the boat just saying hey hey you know wait a second and talks to the captain for a moment and is granted passage he's like well he thinks we're overdressed but he will grant us passage to to cairo they settle in for the trip they sort of hunker down among the various fishing traps and boxes and things that are on this ship bond pulls out his cigarette case and cigarette lighter which combine to make a miniature microfilm projector and he reviews the microfilm we don't find out what he's learned from it but he reviews the microfilm he settles down beside anya who's getting cold and they make some very flirtatious references to shared bodily warmth which is apparently how they stay warm in russia So they start to make out. She pulls her dress up her leg to reveal her cigarette case and pulls out a cigarette, holds it up for Bond to light and blows in his face because it's knockout gas in the cigarette. (laughs) The Russians have gadgets, too. Ha ha. Bond regains consciousness. It looks to be about midday on the boat, still in his suit. No microfilm asks for direction and sort of wanders, looking a bit worse for wear, over to the Temple of Ramses II at Abu Simnel, where where he goes inside to find M's Egyptian office. <laughs> he walks down the, the, the corridor and then there's like a metal bulkhead and he goes through it. There's Money Penny sitting at her desk. All right. Is this a better or worse field office than Man with the Golden Gun? Oh, no, no. That's sorry. The 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 45 degree canted ship still best field office. This is All probably right. second best submarine, third best. OK, that's my personal power rankings of <laughs> Of the MI6 field offices. MI6 field office. Yeah. Yeah. I love that this is just like the inside of this temple, but with track lighting. Bond goes through the doors and is very surprised to see that General Gogol is there. Just chilling, hanging out, looking kind of smug about it, wanders around. And Anya comes in and so does M. And it turns out that the English and the Russians have decided to work together. Like this comes from the the leaders of the country. They're going to put their differences aside and work together because someone who's not them is stealing their nuclear submarines. <laughs> this sounds more and more like you only live twice as it goes but it (laughs) not until later will it really sound like you only live twice (laughs) it only doesn't sound like you you only live twice at this point because we don't see what happened to the sub at the beginning exactly yeah they leave it up to the imagination they have some good banter these scenes are good of bond and anya both trying to basically suck up to their bosses by (laughs) showing how much better they are at stuff anya's like i got the microfilm and bond's like it's worthless i looked at it you know but maybe q can find out something more interesting so then we get the q scene where he has a maglev tea tray to decapitate people (laughs) 
Uh, Q Branch in this movie is so ridiculous. I love it. It's I, so good. I want that ready for Ahmed's tea party. There's a hookah that is secretly a gun. There's a couple sort of squirt guns that fire mud, which we'll actually see later in the movie. There's a camel saddle that launches a knife straight up into the taint of the rider. <laughs> So they pass all of that, and then we get Q using a big projector to show some of the microfilm off. And then we get what I think might be the first example in cinema history of someone asking someone else to zoom in on that part of the image. <laughs> He's like, Q, what's this? Can you enlarge it? And Q goes, Lo, let me see. Boop, 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 boop. And it zooms in. And I'm like, oh my God, it's CSI Cairo. <laughs> Enhance. Yeah. So we see part of a watermark that says oratory with kind of a fish scale thing. Bond and Anya have more back and forth about who can figure out more. She's like, it's a fish, the symbol of, what's his name? Stromberg. And Bond's like, yes, this is Stromberg C laboratory. It's actually this thing. And it's like, oh, well, you know, let's see what's making that tick. Gogol is like, I like this. I you two are great. <laughs> like Gogol <laughs> basically says you two are so cute. <laughs> like I'm paraphrasing obviously, but that's sort of the thing that he's he's like you two work together great cuz you you do not get along and I love it. They've decided to check out Stromberg's lab which has its base in Bond says Corsica. Anya says it's actually Sardinia. And so what's the best way to get from Cairo to Sardinia? The train? Of course. Why do they why go? Not? Why do they go by train? <laughs> They've got two weeks to learn to work together. I don't know how long that train trip is going to take. I I gotta find out how long to travel from Cairo to Sardinia by train. That is wrong. <laughs> I tried to look up if there was an internet train movie database, but <laughs> there doesn't seem to be. I mean, apart from anything else, Sardinia is an island, so you can't you can't get there. <laughs> it's, anyway, it's just it's so silly. Bond and Anya have a lot of sort of sexual tension. You know, they've got adjoining rooms. Bond has some champagne prepared. Anya basically sort of gently shuts him down. Basically, the way this plays out is that they are both on either side of a wall, seeming like they're hoping that the other one will make a move a little they both want something to happen but anya at least doesn't want to let something happen i think bond is pretty clearly up for whatever anya goes to hang up her clothes and who should be hiding in her closet but jaws somehow <laughs> Barely hiding it in the closet. Yeah. So we get a couple of threefers in this movie. It's the third one where the villain has sharks. It's the third one where we get a train fight. And it's another good train fight. It's a good train fight. I'm not going to rank them. I refuse to rank them. They're all good train <laughs> fights. Well, give me your power rank. In no. The James Bond train fights, Graham. Right. Steam, diesel, electric. <laughs> not in that order. That's not my actual power ranking of, of ways. Electric, probably the best. I'm not actually ranking fuel sources for trains. Jaws punches through a lot of stuff. And we also find out that, of course, because Richard Keel has gigantism, that his hand is like the size of Roger Moore's head. Yeah, this is another good train fight. It lifts a lot from the live and let die train fight, complete with Jaws being ultimately defeated by going out the window. Bond uses everything in the train car he can find as a weapon. I think he hits him with a chair. He hits him with a bottle of Dom Perignon. He hits him with a table, manages to smash the, the top off a lamp to expose the wires and like cattle prods him in the teeth with the live wires, uh, which is what ultimately leads Jaws to be stunned. He knocks him out of the train, through the window. At this point, Anya has regained consciousness because, of course, Jaws knocked her out pretty much immediately at the start of the fight. And so she walks in and is like, what happened? And then we get a call back to the comment about shared bodily warmth because, of course, the window is broken open and the train car is cold. They retreat back to Anya's car under the guise of looking at and tending to Bond's wound, having been bitten by jaws she removes his shirt and things start to get sexy in the morning and presumably by ferry because there's a ferry visible in the background even though they are arriving by horse-drawn carriage they're both in sardinia now they sure are but you know who is arriving by car ferry is q driving the lotus esprit boy this is an iconic car it sure is 
the story of how the Lotus got into Bond is one of my favorite stories. Are you familiar with this? No. So everyone wanted their car in James Bond at this point, right? This is 1977. It's well established. Everyone wants to get their car in the Bond movie. How are you going to do that? The head of marketing for Lotus had this brilliant plan. He's like, look, we have a really cool looking car. This this deserves to be in James Bond. Here's how I'm going to do it. And he drove the Esprit, which hadn't come out yet, to the Eon Productions office a little before lunchtime, parked it and left. (laughs) And so everyone came out of Eon Productions looking at the car, going like, oh, what is that car? And then the absolute unbridled confidence of this man comes back to the car while everyone's looking at it, just goes, "Uh, excuse me, excuse me, lets himself into the car, does not respond to their questions and drives away. Wow. Just leaves. (laughs) And so Cubby was like, we got to find out what car that is. We got to get that car. (laughs) And so they did. It's a really cool looking car. I mean, especially once it starts becoming a submarine. But don't worry about that for now. (laughs) Spoilers. There's it does get some pretty impressive spoilers, actually, once it becomes a submarine. (laughs) Apparently, the stunt driver, because it held so well to the road, the stunt driver was having trouble making it look really impressive during the upcoming car chase. And so the Lotus rep was like, oh, I can do it. And just like, (laughs) just gunned it and like whipped it, did like drifts on the gravel and everything. And they were like, oh, all right, do that again. We're going to record this time. And then they just had that guy be the stunt driver for the Lotus. (laughs) (laughs) So, So they've arrived in Sardinia. Q runs them down a list of things that the car does. We see Q talking to Bond, pointing at the car, but it's from Anya's perspective, so we don't hear everything that Q is saying. As she catches up with them, we hear Q point out a couple more things, and then Bond annoys Q by suggesting that he has respect for MI6 property. Before peeling out of the uh, the parking lot. Yeah. We get this nice sweeping shot of them driving into Sardinia, then they arrive at the hotel, they check into their hotel, we get a quip about the fact that it's like, ah yes, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Sterling, I have a suite for you, it has two rooms. Bond is like, yes, money, penny, is being over efficient they get they get taken to the room presumably they settle in but we don't actually find that out because we cut right to the outside a little later a boat bearing the mark of stromberg laboratory pulls up outside the hotel and a a woman gets off ostensibly here to pick them up she basically tells them that she's she's here to bring them to the laboratory so that they can see it for themselves they are posing in this case as a marine biologist Mr. Sterling and his wife and assistant, they hop aboard the boat and travel to the Stromberg Laboratory, which of course is the giant facility that we saw rise from the sea earlier in the film. So the woman is Naomi, played by Carolyn Monroe, who was featured prominently in the 70s in a series of print ads for Lamb's Rum. Oh yeah. Yeah, where she just had this sort of character in the ad, like not like an actual like named character, but just, you know, it's like the spirit of adventure and she's, you know, wearing like wetsuits and goggles and holding harpoon guns and stuff. And this is basically like they put that character into a movie is essentially what this looks like. They were like, (laughs) all right, you, you know, get let's get the lamb's rum girl and put her in the movie. She's very sultry. Mm -hmm. Like she definitely has a presence. Another contender for most Bond moment is as she turns around. So she's just wearing a bikini and like a sheer gown Mm -hmm. over her bikini. And as she turns back and sort of like slinks away bond just quips to anya what a magnificent craft (sighs) such lovely lines So they hop on the boat and take him to the lab. The boat goes inside and we get to see more of the interior of Stromberg's amazing ocean going thing. It's just amazing sets, this whole thing. The most amazing yet to come, but Bond gets in the elevator, heads to Stromberg's, again, the sort of the the inner sanctum room where there's the tanks on all sides. It's carpeted, which just seems, I mean, it's it's cozy, but I don't know. It feels like carpeting a bathroom. Yeah. My grandparents had a carpeted bathroom and it's it's weird now that I think about it. So there's still a little bit of the like rivalry going on between Bond and Anya at this point as well. Like they're technically they're working together, but Bond is very clearly like not 
appear to work together, Mm -hmm. at least only to the extent that the bare minimum is met. Because, of course, when they go to get on the elevator, he's like, all right, I'm going to go up to talk to Stromberg, my wife and assistant here. Could you show her around the facility? Shuts her out of the meeting with Stromberg to sort of like send her and gather a little bit of intelligence on the rest of the structure. But as he does this, Anya's like visibly annoyed with him. When Bond does get to Stromberg's place, he notices in the tank that the arm of that woman that we saw dumped in the tank before is just hanging out on the bottom of the tank because apparently this is the same tank it's a little unclear uh, actually also what's kind of unclear to me and again i i didn't come here to rip on this movie i don't think it's <laughs> i don't think it's bad i just didn't think it was you know jesus if he were a bond film <laughs> <laughs> but I don't I don't quite understand the purpose of this scene. And I mean that from like structurally as the pace of the movie. Bond comes down. Naomi warns him he doesn't like to shake hands. It's not explained, but it's presumably because of his webbed fingers. And so Bond goes to shake his hand and Stromberg just sort of puts his hands together, sort of like steeples his fingers. And Bond is like, ah, oh, yes, right. And they sort of talk and like immediately Stromberg figures that something is up and is like, what do you think about that fish? What do you know about it? And Bond <laughs> is like, oh, well, you know, like just word vomit about all the, you know, the fun facts about that fish and its scientific name and everything. Subscribe to Lion fish facts yeah and then it's like okay well i have to go now goodbye and and like that's it like there's no this is lacking in the bond and the villain sort of do the dance quipping back and forth the bantering as equals the scene doesn't do anything yeah i mean so you're right from the like the structure of the film and for narrative purposes it does not actually really accomplish anything in the scene what we get in the scene is we get a little bit of some of what the villain's plan is delivered sort of sideways because the ostensible reason for this visit, of course, is Bond is posing as a marine biologist to get in and, and try and figure out if there's anything happening in this facility that needs to be considered. For all intents and purposes, the answer he gets here is no, with the, ex- with the sole exception of he f- saw the hand in the tank and thus is like, oh, OK, he's killing people. Yeah, but you're right. They're like they're, he he walks in. He meets Stromberg. Stromberg shows him, tests his knowledge, then shows him the little model in the tank and then is like, all right, cool. Nice to have you visit. Get out. Yeah, that's weird. But yes, you're right. We do find that he has a plan for an underwater city, basically, with this structure at the center of it, like that this will submerge. Because I guess that's not hidden. I guess that Stromberg is this known quantity of this billionaire scientist who has a floating lab that can submerge that like that's not the weird part everybody knows that 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 happens he's an ocean loving eccentric billionaire with a facility at sea yeah i should say that like stromberg as a villain doesn't do a whole lot for me yep okay that is, I would say, of the three things that I think weigh on this film in a significantly negative light, one being Anya just being like, OK, at the end. Yeah. Two is Stromberg is like a nothing villain. He, like he's he's not very good. <laughs> I, d- I did not remember that. he. I remembered I remembered Jaws. I did not remember Stromberg. <laughs> Yeah, Stromberg is like, what's his name from Thunderball that I don't remember? Largo. Largo, thank you. I knew it started with an L. And he's not quite Dopey Dog, who we will meet in Moonraker. Oh, right. uh, (laughs) But he is is truly a nothing villain. He is trying to have some kind of, I'm not Blofeld, but he's not Blofeld. And that hurts him. Yeah. What's your third thing? The third thing is the the opening song. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I think is just like, it it just is not good and doesn't do the rest of the movie service. No, it's just another song talking about how great James Bond is. And it's not even a great song about how good James Bond is. No. So the one other piece of information we get here is Bond is sort of like sent away by Stromberg and he reconvenes with Anya and, their, and her tour guide. It happens that when he re- reconvenes with them, they are looking at a model of a ship and it is the newest ship that has been added to the Stromberg fleet. It is this enormous tanker ship, which our tour guide says is the largest ship in the world. She is immediately undercut by, actually it's Anya comments that, well, it's the second biggest ship in the world after this other ship, of course. Mm -hmm. While they're being led away to like head home, we cut back to Stromberg's room where Jaws walks in. Stromberg is like, so that was James Bond, right? Yeah, those are the two that you saw in Cairo, yeah? And Jaws just sort of nods. He's like, all right, cool. Kill them. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> Cut back to the shore. Apparently they get to shore safely. Somehow. And they are driving around in the Lotus. They they depart the hotel. It's not clear where they're going, but they won't get there, at least not anytime soon, because as they are driving along the highways of Sardinia, they are ambushed. <laughs> Uh, they, they, they start they get chased by a motorcycle and they realize they're being followed but they're stuck behind them like a mattress truck and then the motorcycle disengages its sidecar which acts like a highway torpedo and fires <laughs> towards the car they snake the lotus around the truck between two vehicles and it blows up the back of the mattress truck feathers everywhere and the motorcycle driver gets basically tarred and feathered and flies off a cliff then we get another classic well, another Bond quip of all those feathers and he still can't fly. Is this a more or less obvious dummy than the one in OHMSS? I think it's slightly less obvious because it's not quite as big on screen and it's not on screen for as long. Hmm. And the eye is drawn to the motorcycle, which is ostensibly a real motorcycle, but it is it is an obvious dummy. Fair. So then they start getting pursued by a car in which Jaws is leaning out the passenger side with a gun, just trying to effing shoot them. No part of this is subtle. Some things I like about the car chase. Jaws leans out the car trying to shoot them. He runs out of bullets. He ducks back into the car as a henchman in the back seat leans out his window to start shooting at them. Jaws leans back out the window and grabs the henchman's gun and starts shooting with his gun. <sighs> Over the course of this chase, the mud sprayers are used on the back of the, the Lotus painting the windshield of the chase car. It, of course, goes off the embankment over the side of the highway and falls off the highway, landing in the humble winery shack of a vinter at the bottom of the hill who's enjoying a sip of the, the fruit of his labors. The car crashes through the roof and he stands up and puts his hands on his head and exclaims in Italian what is likely some sort of exclamation of frustration and surprise. Then Jaws walks out the front door of the cottage, dusts himself off, and continues on his way. It's so good. Jaws just can't, Jaws can't be killed. Jaws cannot be killed. Can't be killed. But they're not free and clear yet because as they round a corner, this is another cool shot, actually. They round a corner and <laughs> a helicopter just like appears from below the cliff. What a great shot of the Lotus and then the helicopter. Mm -hmm. The helicopter is being driven by Naomi, who wastes no time in sort of flirting with Bond. Like, not really flirting, but like she waves at Bond is like, mm hmm, like, you know, <laughs> making making eyes at him from the helicopter. Actually, she fully winks at him. So yay. she fully winks at him. Yeah. So how are they going to get away with the well, so there's a bit of chase of them driving and doing the drift and managing to avoid the strafing from the helicopter. But eventually the way that they get away is that they drive into the water. So they launch off the end of a pier and just into the water. Anya's like, well, well what? Wh what? Looking really shocked. And then Bond hits a button. All the instruments change, all the instrument panels. The wheels go inside the car. The wheel wells are covered up. Little fins poke out the side. We just sort of gloss over the fact that there's like a whole propeller unit that appears on the back of the car. We don't actually see that show up, but... <laughs> <laughs> the Lotus is now submersible. A camera pokes out the top of the car and we can see that the helicopter is directly above them. So Bond waits until the appropriate moment and fires a missile straight up. <laughs> <laughs> which completely explodes the helicopter. Bond and Anya make their escape underwater. I like that they had three or four different variants of the car, like just for the given shots. Like they had one that just the wheels folded and then another that just the covers come down over the wheel wells and then one that just the little wings come out just for each separate shot. Right. And then the final version that moves around underwater is just the chassis, not, not an actual Lotus chassis, but one that the art department made being piloted by two scuba divers inside it. Ah, yes. So it's like not at all airtight. It's just like a shell around two scuba divers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's their bubbles you see coming out of the top of it. Right. So now underwater in the submersible esprit, they head back out to the Stromberg laboratory because Bond wants to know if they're, you know, wants to see basically the underside of it from below the waterline. He knows there's like a control room at the bottom. So he's like, let's go have a peek. And it turns out that conveniently there's 
there's a giant window in the control room. So he pulls the Lotus Esprit up close to that. He and Anya sort of peer out the window down inside and they see that there's a bunch of people standing around a world map with some blinking lights on it. Just in time for a bunch of divers to be dispatched with little motorized diving machines that fire missiles. And so now we have another underwater fight scene where all these divers come after them trying to shoot the Esprit. I wish that we got to see more of that set because that's all we see of that control room and it looks like a really cool room but it was only ever designed to be seen from this angle so I guess we never get to see it otherwise. Yeah. What we do get to see though is a pretty pretty good underwater fight scene this time around. Yeah, the pacing and speed is certainly a lot better than Thunderball because everyone's got their little motorized whatevers, which is good. They do kind of get away with murder in terms of editing and continuity again, of just sort of like, where'd they come from? Weren't they just over there now? Like, you never see where these guys come from. You just see a shot of two guys with harpoon guns and little motorized things, and it's like, oh, we're being chased now. You know, there yes. th- there is one shot where the, like the bad guy's submarine comes out, and, but then it's like, but shouldn't you not be there at this point? Anyway, it doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's no way that they're this far they're on the seabed at this height if the Stromberg thing completely submerges. Yeah. This is this is all very like don't think about it too much. Yeah. But it's tight, it's quick. Mm-hmm. They kill a few dudes underwater. They get shot at by missiles. They they manage to subdue the little submersible thing with a depth chart or a mine, and that's great. And then they drive back to shore, where they drive out of the sea onto a beach to the faces of astonished onlookers. So there's one shot of a tiny child, which is Richard Keel's son. Mm-hmm. And then there's another shot of a guy having a drink. And it's the amazing cartoon double take of like he has a drink and then sees the car driving out of the water and then like looks confused at the bottle of like, Muh? Yep. So this guy, he's the Italian assistant director for when they were filming in Italian locations like Sardinia, Victor Turzhansky. And they just put him in there as like a cameo, basically. They needed someone to do this part. As he tells it, they didn't have someone or someone didn't show up or whatever. And they were like, Victor, you do that or whatever. And people loved it. He does this exact bit it again in the next <laughs> two bond movies <laughs> <laughs> if a joke plays reuse it yeah there's a bit with bond dumping a fish out of the car which is like it how did it get into the car i know there was a couple leaks but a fish that big wouldn't get you know this is it's it's very much in the realm of like yeah yeah you know what just let it let it happen for the joke previous to now i had forgotten about the fish mm-hmm. but i think that now i'm saying i'm claiming the fish the fish is going to be probably my bond moment of the movie <laughs> just because he's so like proper about it right like they're driving up and he just rolls the window down and he's just like holding the fish between two fingers and he just sort of like flicks it out the window and then sort of nods to the people beside him and then continues driving it's a great little joke mm-hmm. and i think it plays really well it feels very in character as something bond would do it's not mean at all <laughs> it's It's just like a moment of levity in an already pretty silly scene, but it works really well for me, even though you're right. There's like the fish wouldn't have gotten in there. They had two little leaks in the roof. Yeah, they head back to the hotel where Bond receives a note from M that they have looked into Stromberg's ship, the Laparis, and it has not docked in nine months. And there's no way for a ship that size to be at sea for nine months. So they don't know where it's getting its fuel from. Apart from anything else, we have something to follow up on. Anya goes for a smoke. Bond lights her cigarette. She compliments him on his lighter. He says, oh, thanks. I picked it up in Austria. And she's like, wait, what? When were you in Austria? And he's like, oh, you know, a couple weeks ago on a job. And then she goes over to her wallet and shows him a picture of her lover in the wallet and is like this guy do you know him and he's like well i don't necessarily she's like don't you play with me did you kill him and he's like i mean yeah if he was one i didn't get a good look at their faces but if he was one of the people chasing me in austria then yeah i killed him and she's she says okay as you've mentioned already matt she says when this job is over then i will kill you Mm -hmm. to further your point for later it was three weeks ago (laughs) yeah I can't believe that they're far enough along in their relationship as they are. Yeah. She's got a photo of this dude in her wallet. They were in a relationship for a long time. Yeah. I mean, they, they make it quite clear early on that like they these this was not just like a passing fancy. This was like they were in love. Mm-hmm. Bond has killed Triple X's Tracy. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh boy. So yeah, it it furthers just how bad that is that later on she's like, ah. The worst part is the scene that it cuts to next is like she's, all right, when this mission's over, I am going to kill you. And then it cuts to them being dropped off on a submarine by helicopter and they are of course suspended below the helicopter right on the cable and they are like apparently going down tandem so they're like face to face harnessed together with bond basically like hugging anya and him smiling a goofy smile at her and her trying to scowl and not having a very good job of it yeah it's weird she's like i'm performatively mad at you because you killed my boyfriend but i actually think you're neat so i'm gonna make sure that i don't outwardly smile it's so weird <laughs> it is they are dropped aboard the submarine it turns out this is an american submarine Ah, the third piece of the you only live twice trifecta yes america so we are we're dropped aboard an american submarine we get to meet the captain anya takes her helmet off which causes the captain to like express surprise that that oh there's a woman spy on the submarine he says you know set up some quarters for you but y you may want to use the shower in my quarters and she's like no don't show me any special treatment and he's like well maybe i should and so the next scene is in the captain's quarters a man comes in to report anya's in the shower the man sees through the crack in the curtains that there's a woman in the shower the captain sort of scolds him is like what's the matter haven't you ever seen you know haven't you ever seen an agent in the shower dismisses him and uh, the guy's like uh yeah all right cool and walks out trying to sort of steal one more glance well trying very very casually to not look like he's stealing another glance on the way out the door yeah definitely correct choice for the captain to suggest that she not shower with the rest of the crew mm -hmm. considering by the way does this captain look familiar to you at all yes but i'm not sure where from so this is our third time seeing this actor oh this is shane rimmer this is the last time he would appear in the franchise so far he's still with us but he was the radar operator in you only live twice oh yeah so he's like he came on the screen being like we're we've lost track of the the satellite okay he was also willard white's head science guy in diamonds are forever oh when bond brought willard white back to the lab and the satellite was gone this is the guy that white ordered get on the phone and call down to whomever okay also in the pre-title of live and let die the guy who gets killed outside the fillet of soul shane rimmer did his voice oh okay yeah so this is the fourth bond film that he's had a part in the third with his actual face and certainly this one is his biggest role yeah yeah he plays quite a part in this one mm -hmm. now aboard the submarine they set upon their mission which is to recon liparus and see what it's up to they find it at sea and they set up a position off you know a kilometer or so away and they raise the periscope and they start taking a look at it the liparis has some sort of system where not only can it track submarines we know that but it can also disable them and force them to surface because that's what happened in the pre-title and that happens again here and so they're forced to surface somehow the liparis has managed to get behind them while they were surfacing and the bow of the ship opens up and it overtakes the submarine pulling the submarine inside the bow of the ship before the doors on the front of the ship close and the submarine now inside the Laparis slots into a dock in between two other submarines the Russian and the British submarine that were previously captured as this happens the crew of the Laparis all take up positions all alongside this berth that the submarine has been docked in they fire a bolt into the side of the submarine and it's not clear what that does but it's hooked up to some gas canisters and they attach another device to the side of the submarine the commander of the Laparis tells Stromberg that the limpet speaker has been attached I love it and he proceeds to announce to them you have three minutes for your crew to surrender or you will all be killed as we pump the submarine full of cyanide gas so Several different things quickly to talk about. This is the final beat of why this feels like you only live twice, because instead of a satellite opening up and eating other satellites or spacecraft, this is a ship opening up and eating submarines. Yes, I would say there's even one more beat that makes this feel like you only live twice, which is what Stromberg's actual plan is, which is he's going to launch two of the submarines. We'll find this out in a minute. He's going to launch two of the submarines to different points in the ocean. Each of them is going to fire one nuclear missile wiping out moscow and new york triggering world war three and the nuclear annihilation of all life on the planet forcing humanity to live out the rest of its days in his underwater city at the bottom of the sea 
brilliant brilliant plan stromberg brilliant awesome absolutely terrific you <laughs> weird man he's just he's like goldfinger in his single-minded obsession he's just like i love the sea <laughs> everybody should live under the sea okay stromberg i'm gonna kill everyone <laughs> so they have to live under the sea you what a stupid plan i am going to render the surface world uninhabitable yeah for reasons now i haven't brought this up before because there is no satisfying answer and you just have to sort of accept this when you're dealing with bond films but where does this guy get staff (laughs) he's got a hundred more than a hundred people on here that are like competent at their jobs and they're all doing different jobs those two scientists he's like oh can't let them get word out better blow up their helicopter but there's just like hundreds of dudes on this boat do they not know what the plan is no they definitely know what the plan is yeah and it's just like like that's clear Now, the one thing we do know is that they have been at sea for nine months. So the only plausible explanation I can think of is that they did not find out what the mission was until they were at sea. They just didn't know that they were here to nuke New York and Moscow until they had already been set to sea and that they just had been trained on their roles on a long haul ship prior to this. But in nine months, like... I don't know, maybe I would have tried to stage a mutiny in that period Yeah, if I found the prospect of nuking Moscow and New York distasteful. That's just prime mutiny territory. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, there's no there's no satisfactory answer. Like, where does Spectre get their on the ground troops? How does word not get out? It does none of it makes sense, but I just wanted to mention that. This is surprising no one, an astonishing set by Ken Adam. This is enormous. Last time they were like, so we made a mistake with You Only Live Twice, which is that we built that set outside. And so it couldn't stay there because the outside was just scaffolding and was open to the elements. And so it just, but there wasn't a soundstage large enough for the sets we were trying to build. So this time they built a soundstage. This is 007 stage at Pinewood Film Studios that was built not just for this movie, it was built concurrently with this set. They were building the set as they were constructing the building around it. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then eventually they took this set down to build other sets and lots of other films have been shot on 007 soundstage in its various iterations because it's burned down twice. <laughs> yeah, the most interesting piece of trivia for this particular set, this massive, astounding hangar, was that the cinematographer, Claude Renoir, was starting to lose his eyesight and the set's so big he couldn't see the end of it. Huh. They were like, how do you want to light this? And he was like, I don't know because I can't see the far end of this route. <laughs> <laughs> so Ken Adam, the set designer, yeah, contacted a friend of his who, on the condition of anonymity, agreed to come in and spend like three or four hours with Ken Adam figuring out how to light this set. And it wasn't until after he died that Ken Adam would reveal that Stanley Kubrick lit this set. Yeah. Yeah. I figured that was where that was going. Yeah. So they like snuck Stanley Kubrick into Pinewood and be like, all right, what do we do here? And then, he, you know, he's like, OK, let's use practical lights. Let's incorporate floodlights into the design of the set so that then, you know, sort of figuring it all out, which is why it's like so bright and reflective and just everything looks wonderful and awesome in these wide shots, because, you know, it's just it's got really, really good lighting because, man, lighting this for film would be an absolute pain. So, yeah, it was uh, Stanley Kubrick snuck in to help out as a favor to Ken Adam, basically. They pile out of the submarine. The captain gives the order to evacuate the submarine. Yeah. And they all pile out onto the onto the surface in an attempt to hide Anya's presence so as to not give them away because they're they're trying to all get captured together. They give Anya a hat and she sort of like pu- pushes all her hair up under her hat and just tries to hide the fact that she's out of place. If this doesn't work. They load all the men off the submarine to be imprisoned elsewhere in the ship. Anya's found out immediately. She's, you know, trying to keep her chin down so that the brim of the hat covers her face one of the goons who's escorting them off the ship notices that she's being sort of evasive and knocks the hat off her head which of course causes her hair to spill out and stromberg sees this and is like bring those two prisoners to me and the rest of the sailors are taken off to elsewhere in the ship while this is occurring bond of course notices that there is a missile delivery apparatus in the the hangar that is able to deliver missiles to the submarine so he's like oh okay we we have a problem this hangar also has a camera 
robot thing that goes back and forth down the hangar on a track and a monorail. Like all good villain layers do. You gotta have a monorail. You gotta have a monorail. They get brought up to Stromberg. In the control room, which is this equally amazing, it's all part of the same set, but it's this equally amazing room with a enormous globe of the world in it. It's just, it's super cool. And they launch the two submarines that they already had, and he fills them all in on the plan that we've already discussed. So we, we get our villain monologue. The Laparis, by the way, is also a model. Yes. Oh, God, how big is it? I mean, it's, again, it's one of those enormous miniatures, right? It's like 60 feet long. Like, it's absolutely colossal, because it's, they made the submarines and the, to look good on film the submarine models have to be like a couple feet long and so then to be big mm -hmm. enough in scale to the submarines they're like then i guess the la paris is like 60 feet long <laughs> so we get our villain monologue we watch the launching of the ships stromberg is like all right cool peace i'm out i'm heading back to my undersea lair so that when nuclear annihilation hits the world i will be safely in my home he then is like all right take bond i think he says kill him like i think he orders them to execute bond mm -hmm. anyhow he, he is like take him away but the lady, she's coming with me, and he escorts her over to the monorail. They hop aboard a little monorail car, and uh, Bond is escorted to what is likely to be his ultimate demise. Cut to exterior shot of the Paris, where the monorail car just yeets itself out of the side of the ship, and then the casing of the monorail car gives way, revealing that inside is a boat, and the boat has an obvious model, falls to sea, lands, and speeds away from the La Paris. <laughs> You would you would definitely die if you were in that speedboat <laughs> hitting the water at the speed that they were going at the angle they were going. Oh, most definitely. It's so good. So Bond is being escorted away. He manages to cause a commotion, which leads to the death of his captors. He, they lead him past a cart of canisters and he knocks the cart over. He uses one of the canisters to hit another guy, takes his spear gun, uses the spear gun to kill both of his other captors at once, and then uses that gun to commandeer another monorail car, which is being driven by a henchman. He tells the henchman to drive to the where the prisoners are being kept while holding the, the henchman at gunpoint. He then incapacitates the driver and another henchman who's guarding the rooms where all the sailors are being kept. He busts into the room where the sailors are being kept, kill the two guards, and tells the sailors that are being held in this room to go free the crews of the other ships and then make your way to the armory. So they open up the two other prison rooms, kill the guards in those rooms and release all the prisoners and make their way to the armory. I don't understand how Bond's monorail hijack like works. <laughs> like it succeeds. I know how it functions. I don't understand how it is successful that they don't just go. <laughs> he's in the monorail like he calls the guard over and the guard's like there's a guy in the bottom what and he gets surprised and i don't understand how they didn't get on the radio being like whip whip guy in the monorail <laughs> anyway we get to see the ship like go into lockdown mode where like these massive shutters close in front of the control room and like a big dome lowers down over the thing and so everyone all the techs and the ship captain are now safe in the control room while the crews of the submarines try to overtake the rest of the ship and boy, do they ever. And now we get an amazing, again, like sort of calling back to you only live twice. We get this huge battle as the crews of all three submarines in their blue naval uniforms go up against the hired goons of Stromberg in their bright orange jumpsuits and uh, all taking place on this amazing set as guns are going off left and right. People are shooting, people are dying, grenades are being thrown, things are exploding. They they do at the end of this ultimately manage to retake the ship. Except Except they can't get into the control room. But Bond has a plan. All he needs is a nuclear warhead. <laughs> Wait, what? So they go to where the nuclear warheads are stored. There's this... I don't... Why are they letting Bond do this? We saw in Goldfinger that he does not know how these things work. <laughs> he goes to extract the detonator from the warhead. And it's it's made way more tense than it would actually be because it's like, it's magnetic. And if this metal touches this metal here, then the whole thing explodes. And no one is like, can we think of another way? Everyone's like, all right, getting the detonator out of this warhead is definitely the only way that we can succeed in what we're doing. Go on, Bond. Yeah. So he eventually figures it out. And one of the more science minded members of one of the submarine crews rigs the detonator into a very powerful bomb. There's a brief intercut back on Stromberg's lair of Anya 
who has now been provided with a ridiculous outfit, but also tied to one of Stromberg's chairs because she might try to hurt him or something. And the captain of the boat radios in and is like, uh, minor minor problem with people but we're handling it and everything's fine the launches are going to happen no problem and stromberg's like cool i believe that everything will be okay i mean at this point as long as the missiles fire who cares about the ship that that's basically his theory yeah and as the captain of the ship says the control room is quite impregnable Mm -hmm. so what does he have to fear the control room also has like little slits that can open and shoot guns and stuff out so you can't even get near it so how's bond gonna take his big boom and get close to the thing well you remember that camera robot that's on a track that slides back and forth along the length of the the hair bb8's distant grandfather (laughs) it looks more like an imperial probe droid oh god it really does sorry that's exactly what i was thinking of you're right (laughs) oh it absolutely is but who knows you know bb8's distant grandfather on his mother's side maybe they share a common ancestor They probably do. Bond suspends himself below the catwalk by sitting atop this camera robot as it slides back and forth along the length of the the hangar. Because, of course, the crew in the control room are still using it to keep tabs on what's going on in the hangar. So they're sliding back and forth. And so he's able to sit on it without getting in the way of any of the cameras. So they slide it all the way back over to the control room side where Bond unhooks the cameras, places the bomb at the base of the doors, and then drops drops off the camera thing holding the tracking apparatus and pushes off to slide away to safety only for the track apparatus to get caught (laughs) so bond has given himself 20 seconds until the bond bomb goes off and he's sitting there like maybe 15 feet away from this bomb hanging 40 50 feet above a catwalk below him trying to like jerk this track device free so that he will slide back to the other side of the the hangar and be safe from the bomb i think one of the techs like fiddling with it is what actually saves him as they like reverse the direction of the thing because they're trying to figure out why the camera's not working and he does manage to recede away from the bomb at the last second just before it goes off and it manages to stay safe Mm -hmm. and the explosion of course blows a giant hole in the doors to the control room so they flood in bond and the submarine crew flood into the control room and the captain is like you're too late the submarines have already been given their orders they launch in i don't know like five minutes or something and so there's these two stations and bond says to the sub captain played by shane rimmer can you use that thing to input new coordinates and he's like yes but we would need to know what the coordinates are what's your plan and he says we're gonna change their coordinates so that they're firing on each other so they want to make it so that the two submarines destroy one another and then we get an amazing moment of with only minutes on the clock James Bond reads the instructions. <laughs> I also think this is ridiculous, but again, it's ridiculous in just the right way. It's him sitting there like henpecking a keyboard while consulting the manual. <laughs> he's like, now I think if I do this and then, oh, I see. And he's like chain, turning the page and like, okay, all right. Yeah, refer to page four. Okay. Anyway, it works. And eventually he makes it. So the submarine's coordinates are displayed on the enormous globe and then tells the captain, okay, make that one's target that and make that one's target that. And then we see see interiors of both of the submarines now completely full of Stromberg crew going, oh, hang on, we got new orders. Let's not check where these coordinates are and just radio them into the gunner. And so the missiles go off. Amazing display on the globe Mm -hmm. of the little missiles going pew! And I mean, they should be breathing a sigh of relief immediately because it's instantly obvious that these missiles are not flying at Moscow or New York. Right. But in fact, everyone is very pleased to see that they hit their intended targets and stock footage of mushroom clouds. (laughs) Well used, though. Yeah. The the submarines blink out of existence off the giant globe and everyone is very happy. And then there's more explosions because the Leparis is still going to sink very soon. They may (laughs) they may have injured some of the more critical systems of the ship so one thing i want to comment on before we move away from the submarines is just it's a a detail that struck me all of the la paris like all of stromberg's goons their uniforms are just orange jumpsuits that have no markings on them except for one which is a little patch on the left breast of where their assignment is and so the submarine crews 
all have a little patch of a submarine on their left breast. Yeah. And presumably, like, the folks on the Laparis have, like, a cargo ship or whatever. But, like, this is your designation. You belong on a submarine with no other identification at all. Yeah. Just submarine man. What department are you in? Uh, submarine. <laughs> Oh, what 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 part of the submarine? Submarine. <laughs> yeah. All right. So with the the day now saved, the last remaining crew on the Laparis all board the last remaining submarine and pilot it off the ship as the ship sort of explodes around them. They fire a torpedo at the front of the ship while in the ship to blow open the bow and create a hole large enough for them to fit their submarine through. They do succeed. They pilot the submarine free of the Laparis just before it sinks and meets its watery grave. Meaning that the only thing left to do is deal with Stromberg. But there on a submarine and clearly Stromberg won't let them just board his facility so how are they going to achieve that? Well luckily Bond has called into MI6 and M sent something this was I guess already on the submarine from before yes it must have been and it is what we know now as a jet ski but what at the time is on the side of it in very 1970s lettering a wet bike <laughs> And it comes unassembled. So yeah. Bond is just like, can you bring the package that Q sent for me up to the captain? And he's like, all right. And some dudes bring it up to the captain's quarters and they open it up and there's like a bar that they pull out. And there's like this white contraption inside. And he just hands a pair of handlebars to the captain who looks at them curiously. But then we cut to a shot of Bond still in his like sailor's uniform, riding this wet bike across the sea towards Stromberg's facility. He enters via the same boat dock that he was brought aboard by Naomi earlier, thinking he's being very stealthy. But as he's making his way to the elevator, Stromberg comes over to the PA saying like, welcome, Bond. There's no need to sneak around. Why don't you get on the elevator that I will send down for you? And I I'll see you in a moment. Bond, of course, gets on the elevator that we know has a trap door in it leading to a shark tank. And as soon as Bond has stepped into the elevator, we immediately cut to a shot of the screen revealing the shark in Stromberg's office. And Stromberg presses the button to open the trapdoor and launch Bond into the tank, and then nothing happens. Bond does not appear in the shark tank to be eaten. What? Yeah. And so the elevator door opens, and Bond, standing in the elevator with his gun drawn, pointed at Stromberg, reveals that he foresaw this occurrence and had braced his feet against the edges of the, the elevator, and so the trapdoor did not drop the floor out from under him. Which, we know from Diamonds Are Forever, is just a thing Bond does in small elevators. Which, I mean, at this point why wouldn't you yeah he walks into the office and then we have a like a sort of mental standoff between bond and stromberg and what bond doesn't know is that stromberg has yet another trick up his sleeve he is sitting at this long dining table that we saw earlier in the movie and under the dining table there is a harpoon gun with a long tube running the entire length of the table and so stromberg invites bond to sit down and so bond comes over to the table and does but he's still holding his gun on stromberg but stromberg Stromberg tips his hat by by saying too much and gives away the fact that he's planning to kill Bond. And so as he pulls the trigger, Bond realizes what's going on and dives out of the way. The harpoon hits the, the chair that Bond was sitting in and explodes because apparently it was an explosive harpoon. Bond then points his gun down the tube running the length of the table at Stromberg and fires two shots, killing Stromberg. And then he, he stands up and he takes a couple more shots just to seal the deal. It's quite brutal for Bond, actually. It is, yeah. He hits him four times. Well, at least we know he's dead. Yeah, I know, but it's just, I mean, obviously Live and Let Die was awful and the, the guy just exploded, but it's rare. In fact, this might be the first time that I can think of where Bond just shoots the guy to death. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Like normally it's like they get eaten by their own shark or they eat the gas capsule and explode or they fall into the nuclear waste because there's robot hands. Don't let them climb out properly. Not just Bond puts four bullets into the man. <laughs> One of the, the hallmarks of a Bond movie is that typically the main villain dies in a somewhat gruesome or ironic way. Mm -hmm. And this is not what happens here. He, and, and it's like somehow more brutal than like dies to boiling water or dies to an exploding gas pellet because Bond just stands up and murders him. Yeah. With that done, Bond runs away into Star Wars. Just, <laughs> it does look very Star Wars. Just this it? hallway, this amazing hallway looks like it looks like the Death Star detention level. It sure does. This came out the same year as A New Hope, by the way, and would inform 
Moonraker in a pretty obvious way, but yes. But anyway, Bond goes to look for Anya, and what he finds is Jaws. Hey, look, Jaws is still around. Yep. He also shoots Jaws in the face, and a bullet yep. ricochets off his teeth, and not without pain. Jaws is like, "Ow!" But it doesn't kill him. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't like injure him in no. any way. So this leads to a great little fight. Bond and Jaws duke it out in the hallway. Jaws throws Bond into the elevator, which then just turns around, opening him into the shark shark tank room. Bond and Jaws have a little fight on the catwalk before Bond manages to to kick Jaws in the junk and leap to a lower catwalk. And he runs away to this control panel, which controls a magnet attached to the roof. And so Jaws jumps down menacingly to come at Bond as Bond has his hands on this control panel. Bond just sort of indicates to Jaws that he should look up and Jaws looks up and is immediately magnetized to the magnet. And so Bond uses this magnet crane to haul Jaws up into the air by his teeth and then sort of like crane game him over the shark tank and then releases the magnet dropping jaws into the shark tank which gives bond time to run away as jaws is presumably about to be eaten by a shark except that isn't what happens jaws eats the shark (laughs) yeah jaws wrestles with and bites the shark to death yes something we didn't mention is that bond only has an hour because the submarine was ordered by the pentagon to destroy stromberg's lair in like in five minutes he's like they, they're telling me to do this right now i gotta i gotta do this and bond's like give me an hour and the guy's like this comes from the pentagon he's like give me 45 minutes and the guy's like okay you got your hour fine they're already five minutes over the hour and so back on the submarine the captain's like okay i guess we have to fire then so they do yeah bond rescues anya just as the thing gets hit with torpedo fire and the whole thing tip side with it's kind of unfortunate right it's like stromberg's dead at this point there's no threat well i mean there's all his hired goons there's not that many on this thing we haven't seen another soul i guess that's true which does like pose the question who was going to repopulate this undersea world uh i'm not gonna think too hard about that (laughs) so bond and anya try to get away as the it's amazing the set like canted almost 45 degrees and just started flooding with water eventually struggling against all this water they managed to make their way to an escape pod which is obviously stromberg's amazing like bespoke escape bubble it looks like a miniature version of the of the whole thing but it's like Mm -hmm. it's plush and lined with fabric there's chilled champagne campaign in it obviously a radio and anyway they launch it out and it sort of goes bloop, floats up to the surface and then sits there sort of pinging with radar to say where they are and there we go they they got away and we do also get a brief cutaway of jaws having survived surfacing and swimming away yeah which according to contemporary accounts was was met with uproarious applause <laughs> excellent glad to hear it originally jaws was supposed to die and they had another right. ending in mind and i think it was cubby broccoli was like no people are gonna like this guy we gotta shoot a different ending and so they shot the ending where it's assumed that he survives and people were like yeah i love that guy because he was unkillable <laughs> through the whole movie right yeah absolutely I, i'm glad they made that choice because it's a great it's it's just a great comedy scene at that point in the movie too mm-hmm. it's just it's a funny image of him just like paddling away no land in sight in any direction He's very stoic, is Jaws. Yeah. yeah. So then, yeah, then we get the thing that we've talked about a couple times where Bond is like, so, uh, champagne. And then she pulls her gun and is like, well, the mission's over. And I told you what would happen when the mission was over. And she trains her gun at him and depresses the trigger. And then there's a bang, but it's actually just the champagne opening up. <laughs> and then he says, look, if I'm going to die, can I have one last request? She says, go, OK. And he says, let's get out of these wet clothes. And she throws herself at him and they make out and then eventually Eventually, the little escape pod gets picked up by the Navy. It washes aboard the hangar on this massive boat. M and Q and Goggle and Minister of Defense are all there looking in the window of this thing as... I I love the commentary in the scene because at this point, like, Anya's given up on killing him. So they're totally doing it. And she's like, oh, James, what if our superiors could see? And he's like, there's nobody around for miles. Nobody's going to see this. And then it, like, cuts to all four of them peering in the window. <laughs> I don't know why Q's there, just to sort of make it extra weird. <laughs> 
M is like 007 and Google is like triple X. And uh, M is like 007, what are you doing? Well, keeping the British end up, sir. And then he presses a button and the drapes over the little porthole, the escape ha- capsule close. And a raucous show tunes version of Nobody Does It Better starts playing as the credits begin to roll. The show tunes version was jarring. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that was very strange. And then, yeah, then that's it. That's the movie. That's it. So what'd you think? I mean, again, the baseline for a Bond film is <laughs> is I enjoy all of them, but I don't know this. I think I'm sort of on the, the opposite end from you, which is that there's a lot of things in this movie that I really, really like. But overall, the movie is just sort of like, eh, it, it's good. It's fun. <laughs> but like, you know, like I like I love the Lotus. I love Jaws. I love Stromberg's lair. I don't really like Stromberg. I am only kind of medium on Anya. Like I said before, the first half when they're on an even footing and kind of quipping back and forth is fun. And then as soon as she gets in the Lotus from then on, it's just like, James, help. James, James, look over there. James, save me. I've been kidnapped. Help. I'm useless on my own. Despite the fact that she's meant to be a comparable James Bond. The sets are amazing. The sort of the whole fight scene in the hangar is super fun. The settings are cool the cinematography is like actually worth talking about which is very exciting to me personally (laughs) but it's also just kind of very similar to you only live twice bond doesn't have as many of the really smooth quips as he did in the last couple which is funny because lewis gilbert the director felt that live and let die and the man with the golden gun were not good in that regard because they were writing bond as as if it was still Sean Connery doing it and felt that they should be writing Bond differently. And I felt like I liked Roger Moore's Bond less in this. Like I liked when he was really suave and cool, but also randomly an asshole, as we've talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but in this he didn't have that sort of edge to him yeah that's that's fair i mean like train fight was cool lotus car chase was fun you know lots of cool stuff in it but overall i was like that movie was kind of silly <laughs> all right so my counter to that yeah we've talked already about how this is a sort of retreading a lot of you only live twice and borrowing from other films that have already happened you know we've mentioned that a lot i feel like this is straight better than you only live twice like not even a con contest it is straight a better version of that plot even the things that don't work are better i like the lair in the cave better than the lair on the boat but otherwise i agree with what you're saying (laughs) the other thing i think is like great about this well there's a bunch of things i think are great about this movie that are separate from the individual things that are in the movie this movie strikes me as like the archetype of a roger moore bond movie Mm -hmm. this is the movie that hits the formula perfectly it is silly and irreverent and a little bit witting as you mentioned sort of witting self-parody this one's really good natured which i like it's not mean (laughs) for the sake of being mean it is clearly having fun and it's found a groove and it's working within that groove this one is the one that i think like all the other roger moore movies from this point forward are trying to be and i don't know that any of them are gonna live up i don't know i I have a a lot of fondness for that movie where everything just sort of clicks and you're like, oh, this is what they were trying to do from this point forward. So the the fact that they have brought it all together into something that works mostly on an emotional level, even if it has some mechanical quirks that don't work very well. Like, I think that's great. You know, we've already been over Anya, but I I like Anya a lot. I like that this movie, it's not that she's incompetent. No, she is demonstrably competent. She's let down by the script. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But the character character is presented in a way that is she has a good dynamic with bond and she's not the movie doesn't treat her in a way that's like she's a buffoon it doesn't treat her as anything other than like another good spy who just doesn't get as much of the limelight as bond does to a certain extent that lets her character down but like it's a bond movie as i said so i'm willing to forgive it the like damsel in distress sequence at the end where she gets like kidnapped and bond has to come rescue her i don't doubt based on the way the character is presented that she would get out of it on her own at some point but the film doesn't give us that chance like i really like that character and i like the dynamic of 10 
tension that she brings to the movie, even before she learns that Bond killed her lover, the tension she brings to the movie is like, we as the audience know that Bond killed her lover. <laughs> so we get to see them like be rivals and then be friends. And we know that the bottom is going to fall out of that at some point. That adds, adds a, like a fun and interesting dynamic to that relationship, even if the resolution isn't as good as I would have liked. Yeah, because I do think they really, really whiff the landing on that. On on yeah. on what they have set up as the promise of that. Yes. Right. Yeah. I I fully agree. If this is how they wanted it to end, they shouldn't have leaned on that so hard earlier. I think. Yeah. But and, you know, you, you talked about it. It's like the cinematography in this movie is great, and the gadgets in this movie are great, and the car is great, and the sets are great. The story is straightforward but a better version of that story than we have seen in the past and the villain is not great the villain's not great but there are so many other interesting things about this movie and so many other fun things about this movie and the emotional aspect of the movie works for so much of the film and the character dynamics work so well for so much of the film and it's so much fun <laughs> i have a hard time hating this film hating is the wrong word i have a hard time even being being really critical of this film because I just think it hits so many notes so well that the notes that it doesn't hit are just inconsequential to me. That's fair. Yeah. I And again, I, I don't hate it. I just am a little more critical of it. I broadly agree with you in that it absolutely hits all the notes and sort of sets everything up and knocks them down. I just don't know that it's the one that knocked them down the best. And that's totally fair. So what are we looking at? What do we do? We want to do? Let's start with the pre-titles. All right. There's a lot going on. There's sort of the story set up. This actually combines the best of both worlds and there's story set up for the movie, including that fun fake out with who's the real Agent Triple X and also has a big marquee stunt for me i mean this is pretty high up there honestly for for those reasons it's like third or fourth for me at the moment i you're you're sort of hovering around up in there at the moment where what are you looking at i haven't got a good solid answer for this one on the one hand i think it's maybe my favorite so far but on the other hand maybe it's not my favorite so far <laughs> so when i watched it the other night i was actually kind of critical of it i'm like oh the skiing in this isn't as good as i remember it being not that it's bad but it's not as good as I remembered it being. The final stunt is pretty cool. It's well filmed. But now I'm looking at it and I'm like, really? Do I think this is worse than the opening to From Russia with Love? Because <laughs> like From Russia with Love has, has a great hook, but it's pretty simple. Like it's simple and straightforward. And I, I love it. I think it's it's a great way to start a Bond movie. You Only Live Twice is there because I think it's repeating what From Russia with Love did, but maybe not quite as well, a little differently. I think maybe I put this at the... T I think at worst, this goes in my second slot behind From Russia with Love. I think this is the best opening stunt we've had in a movie so far. And that combined with the story setup that it does, I think put places it very, very high. We might immediately sort of like drop it beneath another better stunt that comes along in a future movie. But right now, I'm I'm thinking this is probably either first or second for me. All right. Well, I'm going to completely be, for the first time, very different and <laughs> say that this is this is still high on my list, but I'm putting this number four behind From Rush With Love, You Only Live Twice, Live and Let Die, and it's going ahead of The Man With The Golden Gun. I like all of the things that you said. I just like the other ones a little more. I think this goes in my number two space. I'm going to preserve the sanctity of From Russia With Love. I wonder what's going to unseat From Russia with love if anything it may not it may oh i'm sure something will yeah maybe song is way easier for me mm -hmm. which is way down there below you only live twice oh wow that far down hey uh, you only live twice i like the music better in that that's it, it's in the ballad zone right yeah like i said uh and i just like the music to you only live twice more than i like the music of nobody does it better which is just, it's very, to me, very meandery. So, yeah. yeah. Which I think actually puts it at like the bottom. Well, no, I liked it more than From Russia With Love. So there's that. You know what? I am going to put it in the same place. <laughs> it's just not memorable. Which is actually one rank above yours, just because of the placement of everything in my list. Right. But I am also going to put it between You Only Live Twice and From Russia With Love. The main be reasons being that, yeah, I, I think this song is better than From Russia With Love. I can sing more of this song to myself. I can't sing it all, but I can sing more of it than I can sing from From Russia With Love. And You Only Live Twice. I was going to originally put this above You Only Live Twice, but then I remember that you only live twice has that sweet string yes which of course was iconically sampled for robbie williams 
Millennium, which ah. we didn't talk about at all. But I had that song, I of course, had on heavy rotation when that was relevant, which just makes you only live twice more iconic to me. And as a consequence, The Spy Who Loved Me goes below. All right. And then overall, we've already upset people by putting OHMSS so high. So at this point, I don't care where it goes, which is why I'm mm. putting it behind The Man with the Golden Gun. I know. Oh. I know. Oh, you wound me, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> ahead of dr no and you only live twice i do think it is a better you only live twice than you only live twice <laughs> all right i'm glad we at least agree on that yeah so it's currently sitting at number six for me okay this is an easy one for me all right this is this is my number three wow and it is my number three because it is easily at least to this point it is easily my favorite of the more bond movies wow interesting all right we're definitely the further we go into this the less we are in concert which is fascinating and cool the real test is going to be moonraker <laughs> oh boy last time i saw moonraker i watched it with kathleen and she was like that movie was dumb and and, <laughs> and as i recall correctly that movie is dumb that movie is dumb and i'm looking forward to it me too <laughs> So the one other thing that we didn't comment on, but is relevant, is that this movie ends with the James Bond will be back. Yes. In For Your Eyes Only, which would not release until 1981. Yes, because Star Wars happened and they went, oh, heck, we need to go to space. Yeah. And so we're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So <laughs> to borrow a line from our good friend Andrew in the 10th one, they went to space. <laughs> I didn't even realize. Oh my God, you're right. In the 10th James Bond movie, they will go to space. Well, yeah, it'll be it'll be the 11th by our count because we did Casino Royale, but it's the 10th Eon Productions film. Does not count. Oh, great. Okay, cool. Well, that'll be it for next time. Oh, and we're going to stick with what we said earlier for our most Bond moment, I assume. Mine is putting the out of order sign on the deceased Max Kelba. Yeah, and mine's the fish. Excellent. Because I think we just forgot to do one for OHMSS because we'd been talking for 12 hours. So... <laughs> That is going to do it for this episode of From Rewatch with Love. We will be back with Moonraker next time. Until then, I've been Graham Stark. That has been Matt Wiggins. Matt, thanks always. Always. It's a pleasure. And shout outs to Matt Griffiths for doing the wonderful video editing and Heather, who does podcast admin for us. And to all of you, both for listening, because we really appreciate it. It's been wonderful reading all these. Despite my jokes, it's been wonderful reading all the YouTube comments from people. Mm -hmm. It's great that there's so many people like just actually watching along with us. It's super fun. So thank you for sharing this journey with us as well. And while it's not required, we do appreciate those of you who Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. Thank you for doing that. And until next time, this podcast will return. Mm -hmm.